Okay, so uh, this reading is sponsored by the League of Canadian Poets. They've been making an effort to uh, encourage poets to use uh, new, new media formats, social media, Zoom, whatever, uh, because of the pandemic, which has killed not only live music, but live poetry readings nearly everywhere. So uh, I appreciate them doing this. And this is one of the first solo readings they sponsored. Um, and uh, the, part of their funding comes to the League of Canadian Poets. And another part of it comes from uh, the Ontario Arts Council. And I'm very appreciative of, of that support. So thank you, my friends from many places. Uh, hi, William. <laughs> uh, so uh, most of you know me, but uh, I'll just do a quick little thing here, a promo. This is, uh, well, it's reversed left to right. This book's called Gearing of Love. That's an old one with a sexy cover. Uh, this book's called Mata Harry's Lost Words, also with a sexy cover. I did a second edition a few years ago. The previous one didn't look like this. Uh, this is my most recent poetry book, which if you can read backwards, it says Time Slip. Came out from Guernica Editions too long ago. And this is my mystery novel, uh, Death by Triangulation, which uh, finally reveals who killed JFK. So that's all very important. Uh, <clears throat> and there's Elena. Hi, Elena. So uh, I'm going to record this and then share it on YouTube. So if uh, you had to uh, leave early or if uh, you had technical problems or someone else you know wants to see it, I will share the link. But if anyone just wants to go to YouTube and uh, look uh, for my channel called John Outen, you'll be able to find it in a few days once I get the recording and, and load it up. So uh, I think I've covered the uh, basics here. Here's, here's how I'm planning to do this. I'm gonna talk briefly about the issue that this reading raises which is uh, using poetry as a way to respond to all the bad news we've been getting lately. Uh, if you have a, if you're a, a news junkie and you like watching the news, it seems like just about every day something worse and more terrible happens. Most recently, the explosion in Beirut, then the crane falling off a building in Toronto the second time in three weeks. It seems like one thing after another, and that's on top of the ongoing issues even before the pandemic, which of course, as you know, global warming is a big problem. Uh, inequity is a big problem. Racism is a big problem. Those things have been going on for a while and we keep seeing like there's more load to being added to this. So it's, it's hard to deal with it. Um, Elena, if you could turn off your video, mute your video, um, just to keep it simple. Thank you. Now we get the big E, which is, is very nice. So if you're not familiar with Zoom, uh, yeah, you may be able to change your view. If you go up to speaker view, which is in the upper right corner, move your mouse up there. You may be able to change it so that you're not seeing all the small images um, of other people's names, which is I'm seeing right now, everything uh, like that. Okay, so uh, what have I done here? All right, so that's better. Um, so on top of all the, uh, the bad news we're hearing, there's also local bad news because of the pandemic. A lot of beloved uh, venues, uh, cafes, bakeries, places for live music, places for poetry have been closing. Uh, we've got a mental incompetent in charge of the United States, the world's most powerful military force, uh, how do we cope with all this? What can poetry do for us? So that's the question I've kind of been answering here. Let me just check that there's nobody else who's trying to get in. Okay, looks good. Uh, and I, I did a little bit of research on this and I found a couple of articles that I thought were helpful. Um, first one, and I put the references for these at the end of my reading. I'm going to share the poems on the screen as well as read them so you'll be able to see the references at the end. 
The first one is called Understanding Trauma, The Healing Process of Poetry by Anna Mae Sachs. Uh, and uh, she says, I've often considered poetry as a core piece of therapy for myself. Ever since I was a child, it's been my biggest way of understanding the world and my own experiences. I see my life through the lens of a poem and it helps me process and heal whatever I may be going through. I've been writing poetry since I was six and I've always credited it for getting me through traumatic experiences and helping me celebrate the beautiful ones. And then I skip down a little bit and she, she quotes a couple of people who say very interesting things on this theme. First of all, Nicole Bouchard wrote on the healing powers of poetry saying, poetry can take the most extreme emotions and bottle them like tinctures that can be used to heal the reader. It is expression, giving a voice to that which we need as human beings to express that gives poetry its strong influence. And then uh, she quotes another writer, Richard Gold, who uh, uh, mentions about a blog uh, he was looking at called Poetry Saved My Life. Gold says, I've seen that life's worst experiences can exist as strangers in us, separate, like people we don't know and don't want to know. Yet these worst experiences remain our passionate life companions. I've seen that our emotions after life's worst experiences can be sealed in a variety of containers, some buried or in a black hole. But I've also seen that through poetry, people can open these containers and move their contents, those painful emotions, into new frames that are more open and repurposed for meaningful life. I thought that was uh, pretty eloquent. And then uh, the second article, and again, the references, if you're interested, will appear at the end of the uh, screen sharing I'm going to do in a minute. Poetry, the News That Stays News by a Harvard English professor and poet named Stephen Burt. And he says, the most famous statements about poetry and journalism hide an equation inside an opposition. It is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there, which is a famous uh, set of lines from William Carlos Williams. Or else they hide an opposition inside an equation. Poetry is news that stays news, Ezra Pound. And I was already thinking about that last uh, quote, poetry is news that stays news when I considered doing this little event because um, sometimes when I try to explain poetry to people who don't really get it, they say, well, what's the point of it? What's it about? And I said, well, it's kind of like going inside your head for a couple of minutes and listening carefully to everything that's going on there, memories, fantasies, bits of songs, things people have said, uh, your emotions, things you're sensing, and putting that into a form that holds it and, and makes it fresh for a reader, even if that's 200 years ago, uh, 200 years later, I mean, the, the reader. Um, and then uh, Bert goes on to say, John Ramazzani, a critic at the University of Virginia, has written about how poets imitate and use and transform the news. By contrast with the seemingly passive mediation of current events by the reporter, Ramazzani explains, the poet's use of language and form must actively recreate an imaginative event that recurs perpetually in the sustained present, present of poetry's inventiveness. So I thought those were uh, both pretty good things to think about while we're doing this. And uh, so what I'm going to do now is, is move on to the actual reading. And uh, for that, I'm going to attempt to share the screen. And so you can see that the text as I'm reading it uh, which gives you a chance to see it, to experience it on two levels. Because I know when people are reading poetry, it's often difficult to take it in when you simply hear it. It, it helps to see it at the same time. And even though Zoom, I don't think, can substitute for a real face-to-face -face literary reading, that's one advantage it does have is that ability to, um, to share the, the screen and show what's going on. So let me try to do this. 
Oh, here we go. Okay, can you all see that? Just type yes in the chat box if, if you can see it. Okay, thank you. William can see it, so that's progress. Yeah, sounds like it's working. All right, so uh, just to give this first one a little bit of context. Um, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Whoops. Okay, sorry, I, I, it bumped me out there. Let me go back to screen sharing. All right, uh, here we go. Uh, a little over two years ago, uh, some of you might recognize this date, something terrible happened in Toronto. Uh, a crazed guy who was very sexually frustrated rented a white van and started mowing down people in North York driving along the, the uh, sidewalk. Most of his targets were women. And uh, this was probably the biggest mass killing in Toronto, at least in a long time. Um, and so, ah, damn, sorry, I'm just having a little difficulty here. Let me see if I can get it back. All right, this is like amateur hour on Zoom, right? So I wrote this poem uh, kind of like the day after that unprecedented, as we're always saying, news came out and everyone was wondering about their own safety, about their neighbors, about what kind of place we are living in. And what I'm going to do, by the way, if I didn't say this already, is stop briefly after each poem. So if you want to uh, put a comment or question in the chat box, just as it occurs to you, I know it's hard to do that when another poem's coming at you. Then that'll give us something to talk about later. Okay, April 24th, 2018, Toronto. My labor fights loudly at dawn with her mom, then goes silent. Her little dog barks endlessly, my knock unanswered. I fear something's wrong, call the superintendent. She's okay. So many aren't. My daily walk is stuffed with a poem seeds, small kindnesses along the street, a chalkboard sign. There are millions of heavy hearts today, but they beat as one. I hear a hole tearing through my tolerant trust of strangers because death, deranged, rented a prosaic white van to mow down walkers. What so enlarges rage? It's bare or must erase anyone. Why are men so broken that their anger ignites all over our world? Small crocuses appear, but no answers. By the imaginary fairy door to an oak's root hole, children leave tiny toys, adults handwritten prayers and wishes. Three smiling girls take selfies in cloud of light. But who really sees each of us? So I'll pause there for a moment if you want to put some kind of response or question or comment in the chat box, go ahead. Um, and then I'll get going again. Okay, on to the next one. And this in, the, in this case, what happened was, I live in the beaches in Toronto, if you don't know that. Uh, just south of me, one block, the boardwalk starts. Uh, but like a, in any part of Toronto, there are homeless people here. There are people 
experiencing mental illness out on the street. And in this case, I ran into an event before I saw it on the news. It was still traumatic, as you'll see. This one's called Washed Up. Unnoticed in the street, he passed here in full ritual. Sirens, lights beating like frantic hearts, firefighters, EMS, officers in shades, blue nitro gloves, the canoe storage guy retrieving his big boat hook. His still form gently lifted, blanketed on the gurney, face paused and grave as a carved pharaoh's. The crowd traded news. I saw him on the boardwalk an hour ago. I'm sure it's the same man. People said he was in their yard. No one asked who or how he ended here in the small waves where Silver Birch Avenue ends. Afterwards, a copter poised, sliced vectors in hot, wet air, glass eye fixed on where someone was and then wasn't. So again, I'll just pause. Uh, uh, John, you've got a question, uh, Karen Shenfield. Yeah, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you to turn your cameras and sound on when you're done. Uh, so we can go back to the chat. I just think it's going to be really confusing if everyone's trying to talk at once uh, during the reading. So forgive me if that seems awkward, but, but that's the way I'm going to try to do this. So if you've got a thought, you know, and you can remember it long enough, don't put it in the chat, just hold it to the end and then we'll turn our cameras and mics on. Okay, this one, uh, a little more playful. Um, I started thinking about the phrase current events and uh, screwing around with the terms current and then cursive, recursive and so on as you see. It's kind of like one of those challenges um, that uh, come up, you know, where you have to use 10 words in a poem and whatnot. Currency's curse. The current is present. News running slowly like Faust's horses of night. As a child, I stuck table knives into an outlet, felt illuminated. A current lesson I didn't repeat. Facts, opinions, lies, course, eddies of dis and information, flowing in cursive, a discursive incursion on my curling nerves. I did not know what I knew how I heard, where I was the moment that, do you? Filling the microseconds, a sped up semaphore signs on. And now, weather alert, climate crisis and day's craziness. Florida man does the incredible, cameras zoom. And uh, if you're not familiar with, with the meme, it seems like every day there's, a news item somewhere, Florida man does something crazy, you know, gets caught with an elevator, a uh, live alligator and a tarantula in his car and some tequila and cocaine or whatever, you know. And uh, just yesterday, a Florida man approached some child who was wearing a mask in a restaurant and ripped it off and spat in his face. Uh, there you go, Florida man. Okay, pushback. Uh, one of the things that does sustain me during these difficult times is, yeah, Carla, that's true. I've played that game. Type your birthday in Florida, man, and you get some, some colorful responses. <laughs> uh, is one of the things that sustains me during these difficult times is nature. The fact that the seasons go on, the, the birds come back, and then they leave again, the, the flowers open. Regardless of how screwed up our human lives and affairs are, nature is still there and I'm very connected to it. So <clears throat> I really appreciate it. So pushback is kind of playing with how we see things happening in one way in nature, but there's also something happening in the opposite direction. Pushback, everything moves in a good wind. Last night an old oak broke, landed on two houses. Now I'm watching slender leaves push the wind back, rearrange its force. Waves fan breezes, fold them like a good poker hand. While I walk these thoughts out, a squirrel throws a beady glance. It says, 
You got no food for me. Forget it. The sideway throws back my the sidewalk throws back my feet. Says nothing. And then uh, this is uh, another way I've found to deal with all the news of virus and disaster and whatnot is humor. It's always been part of my uh, mental coping with the world. So this is an attempt to be funny about all this. Deposition. My attorney submits my deepest regrets. Certain lines in my poem made both Donald Trump and COVID-19 disappear like that, finger snap. I had not read the directive. No poem should contain the trigger words, dovetail peonies partake of contumacious pleasures. It was purely an accident, the struggle of many lexical possibilities at any moment. But I laughed, nonetheless. Okay, and, and we're getting near the end of the reading. Uh, I appreciate your patience with the technical problems and, and not being able to say much or be seen, but uh, this is a four part thing where I tried to take four different perspectives on what was going on. Uh, some of them surreal, some of them more kind of documentary and turn it into a series. <coughs> Excuse me. Streets fill with vacancies, with vacancy. And the few walkers wonder which stranger might gift code changing forms at the edge of life. Schools, churches, cafes shuttered and homes caressed with Lysol wipes. Nature opens its spring collection slowly, trees drawing unfolding leaves on the damp pages of air, green shoots pushing aside tired earth, robins listening for that small music of a worm burrowing upward. From each twig hangs a droplet where a micro world suspends upside down before falling away. So part two of this series is Franglo, and this is a new form I've invented, and you're welcome to uh, try it yourself. Norman, since you've moved to Montreal, this might be an appropriate challenge for you. Here's how a Franglo works. The first line is English, the second line is in French, and then the final line has to be a word that exists in both languages. So uh, here we go. And excuse my French accent. Franglo. I self define the self. Je suis une île sans mer. My hair grows like a data cloud. Mon silence est riche et mystérieux. On the street, I avoid others. Parce que tout le monde pourrait être dangereux until tested otherwise. Hypocrite lecture, mon infecture, the moon watches all, insensible. Okay, and this uh, part three is uh, uh, a response to a very famous poem by Williams, uh, William Carlos Williams, lots of other people have responded to, you'll probably recognize it, even though there's no plums or refrigerator in this one. Forgive me, it was just an itch, and my finger, not recalling the best advice, scratched that spot between nose and cheekbone. It was sweet and so satisfying, but now my finger burns the question, what imprint it left there? Okay, and fourth and final part of this series, Bolognese. Those of you who like to cook will recognize that's the name of the pasta sauce. Oh, cool, Norman. <laughs> So you're already writing frang franglos. Yeah, well, you can do it however you like. Bolognese. I stand near the window, spaghetti and sauce in my hair, wondering how in my life I got here. When I see you outside staring at me, a ghost unfaced, wondering how we got here. We promenade together and meet strangers familiar and on. We play a guessing game. Which one knows she, he is a danger? Which one of us knows who should be avoided? Our root curlicules, curlicues like a bark beetle as we circumnavigate 
circumstance. And let me see, I feel like this is going on a bit too long. So I'm just going to do, I'm going to skip Petrichor and do this one. Climate change. And I wrote this a year ago before the pandemic. We ignore the slow bleed of glaciers as their cold hearts warm a degree. Trees flap their thin winds and sigh. The whippoorwill essays a new area, gone gone. Water and fire rule what humans abandon. Ticks and tree-killing beetles crawl north. Poets try new parallels, recombining stone, blood, wind, moonlight. But word tunes can't halt the wasting. Yeats foresaw all this. The shouter downs rough voices over the weak pleading of the wise. And I'll finish with this one, which um, I asked some of my friends on Facebook, how were they were surviving the pandemic? And someone down in Texas said, well, I like to smoke a joint in the morning and then watch old cartoons on TV. And uh, that inspired me to think of Coyote and Roadrunner as kind of archetypes for all of us. So this one's called Coyote and Roadrunner, the biggest pratfall ever seen. On poor coyote, the world turns trickster, reverses physics and gravity, drops him down canyons, blows him through cliffs. So often he is left with only burning desire and a charred face. He, desperate artis artificer, rigs ever more complex traps that spring him into the infinite, stalled in thin air, the prize ever unwon. Roadrunner a fading, beep, beep, beep. Beatrice, speed of a falling angel, evades, races on, runs painted backdrops into real roads, and dogged Dante still aches for that third line to seal it up. It's waking up to learn everything you aimed and wound up springs back at you, your own worst terrorist, the executioner's hand turning on himself, while Roadrunner as Sky Sailor dwindles, never to reappear. Beeping goes to Minuendo. Okay, thank you for listening and hanging in there. Since there aren't that many of us, I'm going to suggest you turn on your video and turn on your mic and we can have a discussion. Just, you know, uh, wait your turn, try not to talk on top of each other, but Karen's still here, that's great. Thank you, Charlene. Okay, make sure you unmute your mic too, uh, so we can hear you. That's down at the bottom left. I can't hear anybody. Is anyone saying anything? <laughs> Not saying anything. Okay, now I can hear something. <laughs> so I saw a few comments while I was going through the reading there. Uh, is there anything anyone wants to say? Oh, 